theyeshiva.net. come together to try to give some basic articulation so that we should be able to appreciate some of its fundamental concepts. Now, Hebrew University had a very renowned professor of Kabbalah, of mysticism, whose name was Gershom Shalom. I think he died in 1982. Gershom Shalom, in one of his books, quotes a story that he heard from the famous literary giant in Israel, whose name was Shai Egnon, Shmuel Yosef Egnon. He was a great writer. He won the Israeli Prize for Literature. Huh? Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize, I stand corrected. And he shared a story with Professor Shalom. The story is a telling one, it's a characteristic one. And it goes like this The Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, who was born in 16. 98 and passed away in the year 1760 Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov was his name had a custom when he needed something to happen when he needed a flow from heaven to change something he would go to the forest he would light a fire he would sing a song and say his prayers and he accomplished what he had to accomplish and then the Baal Shem Tov died and his disciple had to accomplish what his master wanted to accomplish. He went to the forest and he lit a fire and he said the prayers, but he said, I cannot sing like my master, the Baal Shem Tov, sang, but at least we can light the fire, we can say the prayers, we can come to the forest. And he accomplished what he had to accomplish. And then when he passed away, his disciple had to bring down the heavenly flow upon his brethren. So he went to the forest and he lit the fire and he said, you know, I can't sing like the Baal Shem Tov, nor can I pray, but at least we can light the fire and come to the woods and everything was accomplished. And then he died and his disciple came to the forest and he said, I certainly cannot sing like the Baal Shem Tov. I can't even pray or light the fires like my predecessors, but at least I can come to the woods. I can show up and he accomplished what he had to accomplish. And then when he died, the story concludes, his disciple also had to bring down flow from heaven. And he told his students and said, you know, I cannot sing like the holy Baal Shem Tov. I can't pray like his disciple. I can't even light a fire like his disciple. I don't even know where to go. I don't know the place to go. But at least I can tell the story. And that will have to do it. And this represents the value of telling the story. I'm not sure we can light the same fire or sing the same song or pray the same way or we even know where to go in life, but we can tell the story. And it's a sto story worth telling because as Professor Stern pointed out so beautifully, it has tremendous relevance to our day and age as well. So here, I'm going to highlight one aspect of Hasidism, particularly Chabad Hasidism, in the context of history, Jewish history, and various journeys within Jewish history and Jewish thought, and then demonstrate its applications to our generation and our milieu today whether here in Yale University or the world at large, the Jewish world, and also the larger world. The 18th century caught many Jews by surprise. 
At the end of that century, dramatic changes would transform the face of Jewish life, Jewish community, the Jewish world, in Western Europe, as well as in Eastern Europe. I'm going to say a few words about Western Europe, despite the fact that quantitatively you can't compare, as Professor Sturm pointed out, what was happening in Western Europe to Eastern Europe simply as far as numbers are concerned. But nonetheless, the trends of Western Europe are extremely important to understand. So in the same century, when Hasidism is revealed and expounded, Western society is transformed. Today we define it as, as the enlightenment, the emancipation. The Hebrew word for it is the Haskalah. It's fascinating that thinkers like David Hume, Rousseau, Voltaire, Thomas Paine were all born literally in the same few years, the end of the 1600s, the beginning of the 1700s, the same exact years as the founder of the Hasidic movement in a very different country and a different climate. The Baal Shem Tov is born on the border between Ukraine and Poland. I say Ukraine and Poland because it depends who won the war on Monday or Thursday, you know. And here we're dealing with Western Europe, Germany, France, England. But nonetheless, the Hasidim never saw this as simply coincidental. So the very same years that the philosophers of the Enlightenment began preaching and teaching a new language, a very new language, those very same years, Providence had a new movement, and powerful movement, developing in the Jewish world in Eastern Europe. Now you see, Enlightenment and Emancipation, although not a Jewish event exclusively at all, nonetheless, it caught the Jewish people, many Jew segments of Jewish society, unprepared, and by surprise, enlightenment created very powerful challenges for Jewish faith, Jewish religion, Jewish lifestyle, Jewish education, Jewish future, and Jewish destiny. The fact that enlightenment removed the power from religion at the center of the world, the church. It removed power from the monarchy, centralized power. And suddenly the new vocabulary focused on humanism, rationalism, nationalism, secularism, the power of the individual, the power of thought, the power of reason, ultimately romanticism, existentialism, and all of the various developments, similar and different, also posed great challenges to the Jewish mind, to the Jewish consciousness both on a political and a communal level, as well as what we call on a hashkafic level, as an individual level. A political level in Western Europe, the great question of the Jewish people was, once the walls of the ghetto crumbled and they were offered a ticket, the portals to larger society were opened, the question became, who are we? Are we a separate people? Under Napoleon, the famous statement was then made in France, to the Jews as individuals, we will give everything. To the Jew as a member of a people, nothing. How can you be a people amidst the people? If you're a Frenchman, you're a Frenchman. How can you have your own homeland called Israel, Eretz Israel, Judea? How can you ask in your prayers and grace after meals, we want to go back to a different homeland? This was a crisis. And then there became individually the question, what is God's place? As long as all of the world, or much of the world, focused on centers of power, the church, the king. So the Jews had the king of kings. But the moment focus was now on reason, on uh, liberty, on personal expression in one form or another, Judaism was now challenged to its core. Now... Enlightenment would ultimately travel to Eastern Europe and express itself in different forms. But it would soon come from West to East and would become a major powerful movement in Eastern Europe as well. In a very general way, we can say that the Jewish response to the powers and to the force of Enlightenment and Emancipation generally can be divided into three. 
insulation, assimilation, compartmentalization. Insulation. There were those groups of Jews, especially Hungarian Jewry, which said the walls of the ghetto came crumbling down in the 18th century, in the 19th century. We will rebuild our own artificial walls. We will not allow our children to mix. We will not integrate, and hence we will not assimilate. Insulation became the new code word. We must remain segregated if we are to remain the historical people of Israel, loyal to the Torah, its commandments, as we have done for thousands of years through thick and thin, we must detach, we must segregate, we must remain isolated. Insulation became a code, and it continues to exist today. There is such a segment of thought, enduring and powerful. Its argument is, there's a big world out there, and we are not part of it. We live in our own cycle. We have our leaders, our communities, our lifestyle, our philosophy. We hatch them, we match them, we dispatch them, all within the kehila. Then there was another trend. This trend was assimilation. Assimilation meant we were forced to be separate. We were forced to be segregated. Now that the world has finally allowed us entry into the larger civilization, that is the call of the hour. Now, of course, there were many different forms of assimilation. But the false faith, take Moses Mendelssohn. Moses Mendelssohn is considered the father of enlightenment in Germany. He himself was a very religious Jew. He wrote a translation of Chumash, of the Torah into Germany. He was observant. He was a brilliant man, Moshe Mendelssohn. He had six children. Four of them converted to Christianity. Four of his six children. According to the historian Gretz, in the 18, mid-1800s, close to 50% of Berlin Jewry converted volitionally to Christianity. That's what Gretz writes. He puts the number, I think, around 50%. But the number, whether he's accurate or he's a little off, or it's more or it's less, the phenomenon was an extraordinary phenomenon. I mean, famous Jews like Heinrich Heine or Karl Marx or Sigmund Freud, these are all products of the concept of assimilation. It's a new world or new opportunities. Assimilation. Then there is compartmentalization. Compartmentalization itself can be compartmentalized, but basically it consists of the idea we're not going to completely insulate ourselves nor are we going to allow ourselves to assimilate. We are going to compartmentalize, which means we're going to try to integrate the, both, the best of both worlds. We're going to become part of the new culture, of the non-Jewish culture, but we're also going to retain components of Judaism. Of course, this philosophy of compartmentalization was subdivided. This itself, you know, with Jews. I once heard from the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, I heard this myself from him at a gathering. He said, why is it when one Jew meets another Jew? So the greeting is, Shalom Aleichem. And the response is, Aleichem Shalom, right? Peace unto you, unto you peace. And he asked, why isn't the response reciprocal? Shalom Aleichem. And you should say, Shalom Aleichem. I mean, if you greet somebody in Yale and you say, hey, good morning. You don't expect them to say, hey, morning good. Hey, how are you? You are how? How are you? How are you? Good morning, good morning, goodbye, goodbye. Why is it that by Jews, shalom aleichem, aleichem shalom. And his response was that when two Jews meet, even before the conversation begins, they have to get into an argument. <laughs> so I say to you, shalom aleichem, and you say, nah, what are you talking about? You got it all wrong. It's exactly the other way around. It's Aleichem Shalom. It's not peace unto you. It's unto you. Peace. Okay, now we can begin to shmooze. <laughs> Jews have been fighting from the beginning of time, they say. It's just as a sophisticated people, they gave their disputes and inner conflicts sophisticated names. So we fight with the world, and we created a branch in university called sociology. We fight with God, and we gave it a name, theology. We fight with ourselves and we call it psychology. But it's essentially about conflict. So 
So certainly compartmentalization also divided into many, many different groups. Of course, you have the reform movement. As a response to the reform movement, the first reform of synagogue is created in 1810 in Hamburg in Germany by a rabbi named Abraham Jacobson. My grandfather? No, just joking. <laughs> we're all Jacobsons. We're all sons of Jacob at some point. But he was, I believe, that I think that was the first reform congregation. Reform was one form of compartmentalization. You had a response. You have conservative, of course. You had modern orthodox. You had neo-orthodoxy. Professor Stern mentioned Rabbi Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, the great orthodox luminary of German Jewry, the rabbi of Frankfurt am Main. What's the problem with insulation? The issue with insulation, we all understand. We all understand. Uh, the moment your child is exposed and uh, sees the reality outside of his or her inner circle, the immune system cannot deal with it. If the basis of your religion is based on isolation, on lack of information, you're very vulnerable because the moment you open your eyes, the moment you meet somebody out of your sect, out of your group, your whole foundation could be crumbled. You were never prepared for it. The challenge of assimilation, well, if you believe that Judaism has no value whatsoever and the existence of the Jewish people has no value, then assimilation may be a good thing, right? I was at a conference about anti-Semitism and one guy said the best thing to solve anti-Semitism is let all Jews assimilate, so there won't be any Jews left to hate, so there won't be any anti-Semitism. Well, assimilation basically puts to end the reality of the Jewish people, the Jewish message, the Jewish life. Compartmentalization seemed like a very promising idea. It also poses two great challenges. Number one, where do you draw the lines? Where do you draw the lines with compartmentalization? What is important? What is not important? I was a number of years ago in, uh, in uh, Dublin, in Ireland. I'm sitting in the Orwell Lodge Hotel. A woman comes to see me. She sits down on the couch and she tells me, you, I, I read in the Irish Times about you, I see you're a uh, Chabad uh, Orthodox rabbi. I have two suggestions. You go back to America and tell the Jews to replace the shofar with the violin. The shofar, the Ram Zona Rosh Hashanah, is giving me migraine headaches from childhood. In my progressive synagogue in Dublin, I instituted a violin concerto on Rosh Hashanah. It's magnificent. I said, that's br brilliant. What's your second idea? Second idea is a smorgasbord on Yom Kippur. <laughs> <laughs> and then she tells me, she says, Rabbi Jacobson, if you can explain to me the rationality behind a God who wants to hear a hundred sounds or thirty sounds or nine sounds of a ram's horn on Rosh Hashanah and enjoys hungry Jews fasting Yom Kippur, quetching all day how thirsty and hungry they are, I will start doing it. But as you and I know, these are insane rituals. These are insane commandments. They have no logic. It's ridiculous. Your rabbis made it up, and they should be absolved. I listened politely and respectfully, which I always try to do, and did not respond, which really, uh, you know, debates, debates, where every, as you know in Yale, <laughs> Most debates, no one is listening to anybody else. <laughs> you know, I'm just waiting for my opponent to finish, right, so I can continue. In life, I, at least I try talking to people rather than debating, so what was the point? I'll answer, she'll answer. I listened respectfully. An hour later, she opens up and she tells me, Rabbi Jacobson, last Saturday, I received a triple stab in my heart. Triple stab. I'm like, are you all right? She says, emotionally. I said, what was the stab? I'm quoting now. I'm quoting her words. She says, I went to a wedding of my nephew. My nephew married a non-Jewish woman in a church on Saturday. A triple stab. He intermarried on Sabbath in a church. And I had to attend because he's my nephew and I love him. I stood up and I said, Rebetzin. 
with all due respect, I am very perturbed by your lack of respect for pluralism. You can marry whoever you want, but you should respect your nephew's choice of romantic love. And the fact that he's doing it on Saturday in a church is his choice. You don't have to marry a non-Jew, nor do you have to marry on Sabbath in a church. But what happened with pluralism? What happened with respect for somebody else's emotions? Why didn't you go to church and celebrate his choice of love? Why this fanaticism? Why this parochialism? Why this isolationism? She jumped up off the couch and she said, Rabbi Jacobson, you're an observant Jewish rabbi speaking like this? How do you speak like this? I don't understand you. You're pro-intermarriage on a church on Shabbat? Is your wife Jewish? <laughs> I said, even my mother is Jewish. <laughs> but I'm like, in all sincerity, what's the big deal? And she says, you forgot Deuteronomy 11. I played dumb. I said, what's Deuteronomy? What's it saying Deuteronomy 11? She's like, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Not Trinity, but one. A church believes in Trinity. It's against the Torah. Now it was my turn. I'm like, have you forgotten Leviticus 17? Have you forgotten Leviticus 21? You should afflict your soul on Yom Kippur. The day of Rosh Hashanah should be a Yom Teruah. On Jubilee Yom Kippur of Avartim Shofar. Have you forgotten those verses? She's like, please, this is the cake, and that's the icing on the cake. Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad is the cake. Shofar on Rosh Hashanah is the icing on the cake. You can get rid of the icing of the cake. You can't get rid of the cake. I said, Rebetzin, with all due respect, your nephew says that Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad is also the icing on the cake. And who is the one to distinguish? The moment you say, that this verse, this mitzvah is irrelevant. It doesn't fit into the modern day culture. It doesn't fit into my mindset. Why should your nephew or child or grandchild not say the other 50% doesn't fit into my mindset and his or her child will say the last 10% doesn't fit for me. So where are the boundaries? Where are the borders with the world of compartmentalization? Challenge number one, she responded to me and she said, I have to think about it. Okay. Challenge number two is ambivalence. Ambivalence, it's very confusing when you don't know who you are. <laughs> now, we live in a generation where it's hard for many of us to say who we are because we're open to everything. Compartmentalization in Jewish life created tremendous ambivalence. Ambivalence means who am I? Am I a Jew? Am I not a Jew? You know, when Henry, they say the anecdote when Henry Kissinger became the Secretary of State of the U.S., Golda Meir was the Prime Minister of Israel. He sent, she sent Kissinger a note. I look forward to a close working relationship with you. After all, Kissinger is Jewish. Henry Kissinger, a German Jew, responds to Golda Meir and says, I have to state my priorities. Number one, I'm an American citizen. Number two, I am Secretary of State of the U.S. Number three, I happen to be Jewish. Golda Meir responds, that is exactly why I look forward to such a close working relationship with you, because here in Israel, we read from right to left. <laughs> but the question of ambivalence is a great question. Who am I? Do I read from right to left or left to right? I don't mean linguistically. I can read two languages, I can write two languages. I mean existentially, who am I? You see, insulation has the advantage, you know who you are, but you're insulated. Assimilation is, there's no tension, you're assimilated. Compartmentalization, besides the question of boundaries, created a tremendous tension in the psyche of the Jewish people. Who are we? What is our mission statement? What is our essence? Are we Jewish Americans? Are we American Jews? Are we German Jews? Are we Jews living in Germany? And its tension exists on many, many levels. What is the message to your youth? What is the message to your own soul, to your own heart? What is your identity? 
three general responses. Insulation, assimilation, compartmentalization. Tonight I postulate to you there was a fourth response, but it was not a response. And that's its power. It was not a response. Hasidim have an old little tradition. And it goes like this. Why was the Baal Shem Tov born? Now, that's not an academic historical question why somebody was born. Academically, we can ask, when was he born? Where was he born? How did he develop? Why he was born? That's a Hasidic question, if you know what I mean. And their answer to this question is very interesting. We have an old tradition by Jews, Jewish grandmothers, that when somebody's in a faint, what do you do? Well, first you tell them there's food. Okay. But besides that, you go over to their ear and you whisper their name. You whisper their name into their ear and somehow their name has a mystical power to reinvigorate them. So the Hasidim say, in the late, in the late, in the late 1600s, in the 18th century, the Jewish people were in a comatose state. So God went over to them and whispered their name into their ear. Their name was Yisrael. That whisper was manifested in the birth of a man named Yisrael, Israel Baal Shem Tov. What they were trying to say with this, with this symbolic idea is that the Hasidic movement came to rescue the Jewish people who were in a comatose state. In a comatose state, not only financially, politically, economically, but also in a comatose state as a result of the tremendous ideological challenges created by the new winds of enlightenment. The Hasidic movement then is really a fourth response, particularly Chabad, because Chabad developed Hasidism in a very systematic, analytical, intellectual fashion. We had earlier a conversation at the table when Professor Stern brought out that what's unbelievable is that the Chabad masters documented almost everything. So we have, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of volumes of Chabad literature, of Hasidism, beginning with the first Rebbe, Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, whose liberation, and, uh, whose liberation day we celebrate here tonight. And it developed the whole Hasidic idea in a very elaborate, systematic, and structured fashion, which is what Chabad means. Chabad is a Hebrew word with three letters, the acronym of three words, biblical words, Chachma, Bina, Da'at, Chabad, Chachma, Bina, Da'at, which means wisdom, understanding, knowledge, or according to Rabbi Schneir Zalman, conception, comprehension, and application the three necessary steps in developing a cerebral and intellectual idea. You conceive it, you comprehend it fully, and then you apply it. Chachma bin Adat, representing his focus on internalization, systematic development, elaboration, documentation, understanding, and so forth. What was unique, however, about the Hasidic movement is, unlike reform, unlike conservative, unlike even orthodoxy, it was never a response to the Enlightenment. You will never find the discourse of Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi who says, Rousseau says so-and-so. <laughs> Hume says so-and-so. You'll never find that Samach Tzedek say, Nietzsche says so-and-so, and here is our response. Kant says so-and-so. Goethe Schiller says so-and-so. Schopenhauer. It's not a response. At first glance, it would seem completely isolated in its own self-contained cocoon, not responding to the outside world, to the secular world. It's not even in Western Germany. Yet... Here lay its power, because in a war, a military war and a war of ideas, the moment you're responding, you are already yielding. You are already, you have already been defeated. Because if I attack you, I define the context of the battle. I already have framed you. You are now responding to my war based on my terms. That's the disadvantage of being in a defensive position. I am the one who defines the terms, I define the context. The moment Judaism was responding 
to enlightenment and emancipation, it was already weakened by the very fact that enlightenment has forced it into a position and now it was forced to define itself in context of the enlightenment. So what happens here is that the moment I launch an attack of ideas or words or any form of attack, I now define the context and you are now responding. And the very response, that is the weakness. The interesting thing about the Hasidic movement was not a response. Rather, what it did was, and Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi took this and really developed a, a universe of thought based on it. It said, we must go and revisit and excavate and discover a depth in Judaism, a sophistication in Judaism, a theology of Judaism that ultimately would allow it not only to confront but to be able to give the Jewish people the intellectual and emotional perspective and stamina to be able to deal with all the new ideas that were introduced into the world of Western Europe and then Eastern Europe through the Enlightenment and through the Emancipation. Or to put it differently, the Chabad Hasidic message was not, hey, we have a new reality. How do we maintain God or how do we maintain religion in this reality? No, that was not the question. The question was this. If the Torah is true, as Hasidism believed, if God was true, as Hasidism believed, if the divine God gave the Jewish people an eternal Torah for all of history, what message is there in Torah that encompasses the modern age? It's not how Torah fits into the modern age. The question is, how does the modern age fit into Torah? If Torah is eternal, if Torah is the divine blueprint for existence as Hasidism and Judaism believed over the generations, the blueprint must have a perspective for very different times and climates. So don't look at Judaism in face of the Enlightenment. Study Enlightenment from the perspective of Judaism. The Chabad Hasidic, the Chabad Hasidic philosophy began articulating ideas that were previously dormant and latent in Judaism that allowed, I believe, Chabad adherents, disciples and pupils, and by extension many of the Jewish people affected by it in one way or another, to view Judaism in a fashion that the great challenges posed by the modern age would not only not undermine Judaism, but would actually allow Judaism to unleash a new vigor, a new depth, a new sophistication, and a new energy. And here I want to point out a few of major themes and ideas that Rabbi Shneir Zalman, the founder of Chabad, and his successors articulated and explained, which I see as a direct correlation to confronting the new realities of the world, but not from a defensive point of view, always from an offensive point of view. Number one, and I'm going to say this briefly because really each one of these subjects deserves a semester. <laughs> At least a semester, probably a few semesters. So I'm going to go through point by point briefly. One of the, anyone who's even a basic student of Chabad Hasidism knows, one of the greatest ideas of the Baal Shem Tov, but Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi breathes the idea. I would like to say he's infatuated and obsessed with the idea, but it's not, it's not such an appropriate word. He breathes it. He lives it. He does not stop talking about it, demonstrating it, explaining it in almost every single discourse. And we have a lot of discourses. Is the idea that uh, when we say God is one, Hashem Echad, it does not mean, as Maimonides or other Jewish philosophers said, God is not comprised of parts, or negating polytheism, there's no two gods, there's one God. God is not made up of different units, he is one. But it means something else. God is one means God is the only one. In other words, God is synonymous with reality. The only true substantive reality is divine. Every other reality is essentially an expression of the divine reality. 
in the famous Hasidic words quoting from Deuteronomy, Ein oid malvadoi. There is nothing besides God. What does this mean, there's nothing besides God? It means that the term God is not a good word. Because the term God means God is a being in heaven. A guy who has a long white beard, if you do a mitzvah, he throws you a cotton candy. If you do a sin, he'll punish you, if not in this world, in the next world. In Hasidism, you'll never find the word God, not even in Hebrew. You'll find the word Ein Sof. That's Rabbi Shneir Zalman's favorite term. Ein Sof means the endless one, the infinite one. In other words, that which encompasses all. It's infinite. There's no place, no person, no experience, no space conceptually, physically, that is devoid of its presence. The two great examples of Chabad for this, okay? You're all students in university, so you all know the great gift God has given mankind. It allows us to survive school. It's called daydreaming. Right? We sit, not in Professor Stern's classes, but in some other classes. In your class, they daydream? Really? We sit and our daydreaming, our daydreams are very interesting, right? In your daydream, you can travel to Australia, first class. In your daydream, you can go shopping. You can buy your dresses and then return them. In your daydream, you can... Uh, you can write your PhD. <laughs> in your daydream, you can do everything. In your daydream, you're at a Yankees game, and there's 30,000 people in the stadium, and you're eating your kosher hot dogs, of course, and potato chips, and drinking your beer, and you hear the applause. In your daydream, there are people, there are emotions, there are voices, and then the lecture is over, and suddenly you're up from your daydream, and all the characters are gone. And you ask yourself the question, and forgive me for this foolish question, what happened to all the 30,000 characters in your daydream? What happened to them? Where are they? And the answer is, well, the definition of their existence was you thinking about them. They did not have an existence outside of your thought. The very definition of their existence is you are actively thinking about them. That is what constitutes their substance. So the moment you stop thinking of them, they are not here. Well... Guess what? Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi says, that's the world. The world has created something from nothing. This is already a term used by Nachmanides, by Maimonides, may I and Liesh. Nothing from so something from nothing means the entire definition of reality is what? God thinking. God speaking us into existence. We, uh, Descartes said, uh, I think therefore I am. So Rabbi Shnei Zalman says, God thinks, therefore I am. Or God speaks, therefore I am. In other words, the very definition of reality is what? Is divine energy. That is reality. That is the definition of reality. We don't exist outside of the divine creative power. This became a major idea in Chabad philosophy. What did it do? What did it try to bring out? What it brought out was... Never feel inferior to the world. What it gave the chassid was an internal pride, not coming from pompous arrogance, etc., but the understanding that the Torah, which is the divine blueprint for life, essentially constitutes a blueprint for all of existence. Essentially, it allowed the chassid to face the world and not to surrender and say, Oi, what will happen to Judaism with so much out there in the big world. When Chabad Hasidus explained that the whole world essentially is a manifestation of divine energy. You can find God everywhere. There are divine sparks everywhere. Every true substance in the world is some type of expression of godliness. And because of that, you don't have to shun it. You don't have to run. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to develop an inferiority complex. Because you see the world in a very different way, from a very different perspective. He took it further and he said, the primary role and mission statement of the Jew is to reveal the oneness of reality within a fragmented planet. He uses those two biblical stories, interpreting them very originally. Why did the spies not, you know the story, why did the spies not want to go into Israel? Suddenly they backed over, they said, we can't go into Israel. They saw all these miracles, they left Egypt, the sea split, and then suddenly we can't go into the land of Israel. And Rabbi Shnei Zalman and the Torah says, not we can't. They said Judaism will be destroyed in a civilized country. We belong in a desert. We belong in a cocoon. We want to be isolated. We don't want to go into the real world. This is how he explains the argument between Joseph and his brothers. 
Joseph's brothers despised him. Why? Over a colorful tunic? Go to century 21 and buy yourself a tunic. Why do they despise him? Rabbi Shnei Zalman explains there was a major philosophical question. The brothers said, for monotheism to survive, we have to remain shepherds, isolated. Let's go to our shtibel. Let's live in a cocoon, in a spiritual cocoon, and that's where monotheism will thrive. Joseph had a different vision. Joseph would become the prime minister of Egypt. He would become one of the great economists of the generation. He would speak the Egyptian language. He would dress an Egyptian person. They said, you are the black sheep of the family. If you are the future, there's no future. Ultimately, it turned out Joseph was right. Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi's argument is, Joseph taught the Jewish people for generations a lesson. And that is, godliness can be found everywhere. The oneness of reality includes every segment of society and every aspect of the world. There is no such a thing that you can experience spirituality and mysticism in heaven. Rabbi Shnei Zaman was a mystic par excellence, but for him, the true mystic is the mystic who integrates heaven and earth. The mystic who generates a kiss between soul and body, between God and humanity, between heaven and earth, between the material and the spiritual, between the sublime and the imminence between that which we see visually and we touch with our fingers and that which our soul yearns for. For him, the underlying mission statement of the Jewish people is to reveal oneness within diversity, to reveal oneness within a fragmented earth. His whole book of Tanya, his magnum opus, is based on the fact, if I could paraphrase my own words, the forces of enlightenment the forces of emancipation, the forces of modernity, of secularism, of egotism, they didn't begin in Western Europe. They begin in the very consciousness of man. He says we have two souls, we operate on two levels of consciousness. One is a secular level of consciousness, which he calls an animal consciousness. It's basically Darwin, Freud model, where we are essentially not much different than animals. We are essentially developed apes. We are essentially developed beasts. We're focused on self-preservation, self-gratification. My ego versus your ego. And then we have a godly soul, a transcendental soul, which yearns for truth and unity and sees the unity in the world, where you and I are deeply connected. And our function is to create peace between the two souls because there is a battle. So what he did was, the conflict between modernity and Judaism, he turned into a conflict in every person's soul. If you're not going to deal with that conflict in yourself, then you're not beginning to tap into the essence of what Judaism is. Point number three, a critical point in Chabad. Religion has often described God as talking to people. God is in heaven and he talks to us. He gives us commandments. In Hasidism, there was a new language. God doesn't speak to you only. God speaks through you. To put it differently, to put it differently. As long as the basic structure of civilization was based on rulers, kings, monarchs, humans were comfortable with surrender. I have to surrender to the king, I'll surrender to God. Why not? Suddenly, modernity introduced a new language. I'm not surrendering to anybody. Life is about self-expression, self-actualization. If I were to ask any one of you in an intimate conversation, who is it that you surrender your life to? Your mother-in-law? Your mother, your father? What do you mean? I don't surrender to anybody. I surrender to me. We are the me generation. We are the generation that believes in iPhones and iPods and iPads. And even we have a game called We. It's spelled with two I's. <laughs> even our We's are based on I. Self-expression, my mind, my heart will dictate my life. What's the place for God in such a life? So Nietzsche said what he said about God for good reason. Rabbi Shnei Zalman said, mm. he quoted that lovely verse in Job, but in his hands it became a different verse. Job says, Mipsori echzeloka. Rabbi Shnei Zalman says, From my flesh I shall perceive God. And he says this. You don't look for God outside of you. If you go into your own flesh, if you dig deep into yourself, if you take a good look into the mirror, you'll find God. God is not above you. 
God is the essence of the you. Every person has an essential soul, which he calls a soul, which is a part of God, which is divine, which is sacred. You don't have to become holy. You are essentially holy. You are a part of the divine. Now you have to reveal that in the external aspects of your life. So what he felt was, you're looking for self-actualization. You're looking for self-expression. You will find it in the Torah. You will find it in a mitzvah. In Chabad, a mitzvah is not translated as commandment. You know what a mitzvah is translated as? In Talmud, the word mitzvah is used in the term litzavot, which means a link, a connection. No one wants to be commanded, right? But everyone wants to be connected. <laughs> Torah is not translated as law. It's translated as lessons. We hate laws, but life lessons? We love life lessons. We love to be connected. For him, the Torah and the mitzvahs were not imposed on you for the next world rewards. No, this was the natural, most authentic, deepest expression of the Jew. Because if you dig deep into yourself, you will find how spiritual you really are. And if you ignore that, he believed, there will be a void that will not be filled and it will cause you to become grouchy and hungry and depressed. You know when people don't eat for a while, they get into very bad moods? And he believed that if you don't feed your soul, it also gets into a very bad mood. And mo many of the t much of the turmoil we have in our consciousness from the Chabad perspective is based on the dichotomy between the various forces within us and our inability to acknowledge and embrace what is truly underlying within our system. This was a major development in thought. Now as usual with Chabad, it was never new or innovative. Rabbi Shnei Zalman proves everything in the Talmud, in the Kabbalah, in the Zohar, in the Midrash, in the Bible. But the way he excavated it, the way he, he developed it, the way he found it, from my flesh I perceive God. It's a verse in Job. The soul is a part of God. It's a verse of Job. But somehow the other commentators don't translate the words chelik elokami mal, a part of God above, as Rabbi Shnei Zalman in the second chapter of Tanya. Which brings us to another point, another major point, and that is love. Love. You all know the Talmudic story in Shrachtet Shabbat, page 31. A Gentile comes to Shammai, the sage, and he says, Teach me the whole Torah while I'm on one leg. How long can you stand on one leg for? 40 seconds, 2 minutes. Shammai says, Out of here. I'll come to you. I'll say, Teach me physics on one leg. Right? Teach me, teach me mathematics on one leg. What type of chutzpah? Shammai throws him out. He comes to Hillel and says, No problem. I'll teach you all of Torah in 6 seconds. What you dislike to be done to you, don't do it to anybody else. That's the whole Torah. Everything else is a commentary. Go study the commentary. Rabbi Shneir Zalman asks the obvious question. Come on, this is all of Torah? Not eating spinach on Yom Kippur has to do with love? Putting a mezuzah on your door is love? Tefillin is love? Shabbat is love? Mikveh is love? Some mitzvot are about love. Most mitzvot are not about love. The answer he gives is very original and it's based on his entire philosophy and he says this, how can you really love somebody else? Nietzsche said, Friedrich Nietzsche said, we don't love other people, we love our version of them. Is that true? Rabbi Israel Salanter, the founder of the Musser movement, now that's a whole other movement, Rabbi Yisrael Lipkin, once sees a Jew eating chicken with a lot of passion. He says, calm down. The Jew says, I love the chicken. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter says, really you love the chicken? He says, absolutely. He says, wow, is this what you do with everything you love? You have it killed, sliced, plucked, satayed, cooked, and then converted into your blood? Is this how you treat everything you love? You don't love the chicken. You love your taste buds. You love your abdomen. You don't love the chicken. When I say I love you, I love my girlfriend, I love my boyfriend, I love this one, I love this one, is it them you love or is it just yourself that you love and they happen to serve your needs? All love essentially in the famous works of the uh, term of Jewish philosophy, Chovot HaLavovot, Kol Ava Chozeres El HaOev. All love is about me. I love you because I get a kick out of you because you enhance my life. Is there a possibility for real love? Rabbi Shnei Zalman in his Tanya writes, no, 
There's no possibility for real love because life is about self-preservation and self-gratification. I love you because I get something out of it. Besides, if I can somehow love my real self, and for him, what's the real self? The real self is the real essence of all of creation. It's the real essence of myself as well. It's my soul. My soul is divine. And then I can really love you because my soul and your soul are one, are interconnected. So Hillel was telling this Gentile convert, all of Torah teaches us how to love because all of Torah is about getting in touch with your soul. Every mitzvah is another way of accessing your soul. So every mitzvah is a commentary on love because you can only love if you access your soul. I want to conclude with one more point of his teachings, and for this I'm going to share a little story that I heard from Professor Eli Wiesel. And I love this story. It's a great story about life. He says there was once this young Hasidic Jew who would sit and learn all day. He would study Talmud all day, and one day he closed the book, and he said, that's it, I'm not learning anymore until somebody can tell me what is the meaning of life? Why am I alive? I just have to know the meaning of life. And they take him to one therapist or, and another psychologist and another rabbi and another teacher. And everyone is just telling him, forget about the big questions. Just get back to the books and study. Forget about the questions. But he can't rest. He can't relax. He's filled with turmoil. So they take him to the big Hasidic master. And he comes in and he says, Rebbe, what is the meaning of life? Please tell me, I beg you, what is the meaning of life? And the Rebbe gives him a potch. He gives him a smack in his face. And he says, Rebbe, Master, why? Why do you smack me? I ask such a good and innocent question. What is the meaning of life? Just answer me. And his Rebbe says, you know, you're asking such a good question. Why ruin it with an answer? You see, it's the question that unites us. It's the answers that divide us. Stay Hold on to the question. The question unites us. The answer is that's where we go different ways. Here, finally, is another major contribution of Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, and that is he embraced paradox, I believe, like no scholar before him. If you study his works well, he did not cease to embrace paradox and was somehow quite comfortable with the synthesis of paradoxes. There are those who claim that Rabbi Shnei Zalman synthesized what would be akin to a physicist coming and saying, I will synthesize the physics of Aristotle, Newton, and Einstein. In other words, it's impossible. These are different systems. And yet, Rabbi Shnei Zalman is always embracing paradoxes. Perhaps, perhaps, and maybe this scholar, if he would have taken it a little further and introduced quantum mechanics and uh, string theory and Schrodinger's cat and two opposites happening simultaneously on a subatomic level, perhaps more interesting uh, synthesis can occur. But I'll give you an example. Passion versus scholarship, which prevails in Jewish life. Normatively, most scholars love saying the Misnagdim versus the Hasidim. We'll soon read Professor Stern's book on the Gaon of Vilna. The Gaon of Vilna is the genius. That's the name of his book, the genius. The genius par excellence. The man who's completely dedicated to learning, 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 the father of the yeshiva world. And then you have the Hasidim who say, let's say L'chaim, give me the schnapps, and let's go, ay, 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 ay. And both serve a role. One embraces passion, one embraces intellect. With Rabbi Shnei Zaman of Liadi, that distinction would be very, very poor judgment. There is no... The amount of attention and focus that he placed on rigorous study for the sake of study was almost unprecedented. He is the one, since Maimonides, six centuries, six, seven centuries since Maimonides, the first person to write his first work, his first work published, Hilchos Talmud Torah, 
four unbelievable chapters where he compiles everything about the study of Torah with a lot of original ideas in which he elevates Torah study above everything. Even in his discourses, he embraces passion, and yet, in his own personal life, when you see his works and his output, and what he demanded from his Hasidim, embraces tremendous intellectual entrenchment. Another issue, love versus action of mitzvot. Till today, there is what we call spiritual Judaism and what we call action-oriented Judaism. Is Judaism about meditation, relationships, feelings, or about action? That paradox, he embraces both with rigorousness. Perhaps most interesting is there were, I don't mean it literally, but there were two gods in Jewish history. Okay? There's the god of the Jewish philosophers and there's the god of the Jewish mystics, of many of the Jewish mystics. The god you can feel, the god that is intimate, the god that you can affect, the god that cries and laughs with you. There is the abstract God beyond abstractions. We can't even refer to him as anything, not even as him, not even as existence. And then there is the God of the Zohar, the intimate God. Rabbi Shnei Zalman's works, hundreds and hundreds of discourses, he will not leave go of this, and he will not leave go of this. As he always begins his discourses, there is Mamali Kalalman and Soviv Kalalman. There's the God who fills the world, and there's the God, the infinite God, who transcends the world. And somehow all of Judaism is based on embracing that paradox and living that paradox, living that tension, because it's in that tension where the full splendor of Jewish life, from his perspective, emerges. Now, if I take all of this and I apply it to the 21st century, where are we left today? If I look at the Chabad movement today, it's certainly not Chabad of uh, 1812, 200 years ago, the year Rabbi Shnei Zalman passed away while running away from the Napoleonic Wars against Russia. It's 200 years later, literally two, two, two centuries exactly from 1812, the year when Rabbi Shnei Zalman returned his soul to its maker. But when I look today, you'll notice some very powerful ideas. Number one, Professor Stern couldn't say it better, the concept of inner Jewish pride and confidence not based on some uh, primitive pompousness and superficial arrogance, which would be ridiculous and narrow-minded, but based on the idea that Judaism never has to shrink and duck in the presence of a world. On the contrary, Rabbi Shnei Zalman taught that the whole world craves to be united with God. The whole world craves to put its mouth on mouth of man and declare Yit Gadal Yit Kadash Mei Rabbah. The whole world is essentially a manifestation of Torah, a manifestation of divine. So why are you running? Why are you running? Don't run and don't hide. You have a powerful message that can teach, that can inspire, that can illuminate a world. Judaism is a blueprint for the Jewish people, but it's also a blueprint for tikkun olam, the concept tikkun olam, although it was coined by other groups and other denominations, but in the Hasidism of Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, all of Judaism is tikkun olam to redeem the world, to transform the world, a world waiting, waiting for tikkun, a world waiting for them. The concept of Chabad, for example, using modern technology, not shunning modern technology. Right now we're using modern technology to talk about Chabad. Right? Where people often say, Hasidic group, why are they not isolated? It's the same issue. For Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, every development in the world at its core is there to be used in the service of the spiritual core of the universe. Or in Kabbalistic terms, there are sparks everywhere, there are holy sparks everywhere, you just have to find them. The concept of Chabad, known as Shlichut, Chabad has sent out ambassadors and emissaries to all corners of the world. It's all based on this, on this very concept. It's never about isolationism. It's about the truth of Judaism can be articulated and expressed in all circumstances to all people. Because, ultimately, as Rabbi Shnei Zalman taught and never stopped teaching, There is nothing outside of divine oneness. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat>
him in Greece until the 20th century, late in the 20th century. Right. Herzl was no reformed Jew. <laughs> Herzl was no Reformed Jew, and Max Nordo was no Reformed Jew, and Nathan Birenbaum, who coined the term Zionism, later became a, an observant Jew, a Balchuva, but then at the first Zionist Congress was not. Um, Zionism was a rejection, as Professor Stern said, uh, of tradition. Now, when we talk about Zionism itself, you have to understand there's two elements of Zionism. There's the love to the land of Israel. For example, the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, his name was Rabbi Shmuel, the son of the Tzamech Tzedek, a grandson of Rabbi Shnei Zalman. In his time, there was a movement called, he, he, he died in 1882. And that's the beginning, uh, the beginning of the Zionist movement. And there was an organization called Bilo, Bilo in Russia, which is acronym Bet Yaakov Lechuvenelcha. House of Jacob, come and let us go to the land of Israel. And he told them, he told its leaders, if you just add two words to Bilo, Ba'or Hashem, Beit Yaakov, L'chuven Elcha, and the verse continues, Ba'or Hashem, the house of Jacob, let us go with the light of the divine. He says, I will go, and I will bring a million Jews from Russia to the land of Israel. Uh, the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe said this, add those two words. So you have to remember, you have to make an important distinction. Zionism, from the word Sion, every serious Jew said many times a day, God should bring us back to Zion. The challenge of Zionism was it developed as a very anti-Torah movement, anti-tradition movement. You understand what I'm saying? So that's, that's a very important distinction. In other words, the Zionism has developed as a political movement, and even that itself. You have the Zionism of Herzl, you have the Zionism of Echad Ha'am, you have the Zionism of Martin Buber, and they itself were very split and fragmented, even concerning secular political Zionism. The challenge of religious traditional Jewry was that the mandate of Zionism was nationalism will replace tradition. Nationalism will replace Torah. If we can only have a state, then we solve the Jewish problem and we do not need any more Judaism. And this is where the great challenge and conflict between Zionism and tradition, tradition developed. Herzl felt very strongly. You ever read Herzl's book? Herzl, the, the, the founder of the Zionist movement, felt very strongly that with the establishment of an independent Jewish state, two major things would happen. Two major things would happen. First of all, it would normalize the Jewish condition. Because he felt a lot of the anti-Semitism is being caused because Jews are seen as parasites. They live in other countries, in other states. If they would have their own homeland, they would be treated finally as ordinary people all anti-Semitism would cease if they only have their own state. He felt the Jews would be able to protect themselves. He felt that Jews with a state also don't need a Torah. The whole concept of tradition is obsolete. Well, today, it's more than 100 years afterwards. It's very sad to say Jews today, thank God, have a state, we have Israel. Not only did it not uh, eliminate anti-Semitism, but Israel actually is today the great... Uh, target of all anti-Semites in the world. Israel became the new Jew. Israel is now the Jew. So that's very telling. But essentially that was the conflict between tradition and Zionism, but not the concept of the holiness and the preciousness of the land of Israel. Your third question was, or you also forgot? No, I don't know. <laughs> Remind me? No, the third question was, if a Jew is a Jew first, how does one balance that with their other, otherwise national obligations? Okay. And if if the idea is that there's always the presence of right. being a Jew, then how can you claim that, saying that Jews are very Jews well. versus From the perspective of Chabad, the perspective of Chabad, the answer is that a basic tenet of Judaism and of Torah is, to quote the verse in Jeremiah, we are responsible to pray and care for the welfare of the country and state in which we live in. To quote the Talmud, Dina de Malchuta Dina. The land, the law of the land is law. From the Chabad perspective, a Jew being conspicuously Jewish, a Jew being proud of his Judaism in a true internal refined fashion, not only will not uh, generate or create anti-Semitism, on the contrary, it generates respect. You know what you remind me, there was once a, uh, so what they say, Dr. Tversky, he's a Jewish psychiatrist, was on a plane, <coughs> dressed like a Hasidic Jew, round black hat, long black coat, square white beard, and a Jewish woman sitting near him turns to him in Yiddish and says, you are a shanda, you are a disgrace. You stand out. If you would only dress like everybody else, 
there would be no anti-Semitism. So he looked at her, and in a perfect English he says, excuse me, ma'am, I failed to comprehend your verbiage. I am Amish. <laughs> she says, oh, I'm so sorry, I thought you were Hasidic. I love the Amish. He says, why? She says, you know, you guys are a minority, and yet you maintain your heritage with such pride and dignity. <laughs> so now he responds to her in Yiddish. He says, aha, if I would have been Amish, you're proud of me, but just because I'm Jewish, you loathe me. So I bless you that one day you should appreciate in your own what you can appreciate in other people. Um, I think, I truly believe that uh, if the world will one day come to admire the Jewish people, it's when the Jewish people will start admiring the Jewish people. I think the world uh, appreciates, respects, and loves Jews, love Jews when there are Jews who love Jews, when there are Jews who respect their own Judaism. I think it makes the world comfortable with the Jews when they sense that the Jewish people are comfortable with themselves. I think when we try to uh, out-Gentile the Gentiles and uh, we assimilate in order to find favor and to just be able to attract that claim that we're normal, historically, it has only exasperated anti-Semitism. It's not the cause of anti-Semitism, but it has exasperated it. So um, I really don't think that a Jew who's confident with his Judaism <coughs> evokes anti-Semitism. The people that hate us, the people that want us dead, Ahmadinejad does not love uh, <coughs> secular, left-wing, anti-Israel Jews uh, more than he despises ultra-ultra-orthodox fundamentalist Jews who are against the Palestinian state. Ahmed Ahmadinejad would like both types of Jews uh, to be dead. The same was Yasser Arafat and the same as Mr. Nasrallah and the same as uh, Hezbollah and Hamas as well. I think for the ordinary fine human being, a Jew who is comfortable in his or her skin um, garners respect and admiration far more than the other way. I feel like you kind of split on the first part of my question there. In the sense that, um, let, me let me rephrase, maybe not slightly. But you make the point that basically we are to respect the rules of whatever land we're in, but we should also be proud Jews. I guess more, more of my question is to pick that apart. I'm sorry to monopolize the time. But uh, what do you do when there's a tension between those two things? And why aren't, I don't think Jews are very uh, vocal about explaining that kind of nuanced point that you just made. And we can do this offline either. No, no, it's a good point. But, but anyone who's, who's loyal to Jewish sources and Jewish observance knows that the sensitivity and the obligation that Jewish law confers upon the serious Jew to be honest, to be straightforward, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be a good citizen is obvious, it's certain. Judaism, in other words, only refines one's behavior in the face of a secular society. Only fine-tunes our sensitivity to other people. The emphasis in Judaism on ethics, on moral refinement, on the dedication to charity, to education, to the needy, to the poor, these are basic tenets of Judaism that when a Jew is truly entrenched in Judaism, I think they become sources of inspiration for the Gentile world, how they themselves can enhance their family lives. The concept of the Jewish Sabbath, the concept of, of Jewish mitzvot, the concept of discipline and eating, and in so many other areas, the focus on, uh, on faith, on love, etc. I think these are items that not only we should not hide, we have to display it because we are obligated to serve as sources of light, of hope, uh, of love, as ambassadors of inspiration to a society that today needs it more than any other time. In a society, even a beautiful society as America, where there's so much family disintegration, where marriages, so many marriages face a crisis, where there's so much confusion, where there's ambivalence, where there's depression, where there's a lack of meaning, where so many young people are miserable, even people at Yale University who have bright careers and yet psychologically have inner anxiety and misery, present company excluded. I, I think... Huh? <laughs> Actually, I would exclude present company. You wouldn't exclude present company. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you're also human and normal. So I think, I, think, uh, I think on the contrary, it's our obligation today as Jews who have been around for 4,000 years through thick and thin 
to serve as ambassadors of love, of light, of hope, of inspiration, of guidance to the larger Jewish world. It would be immoral of us to duck and say, we have nothing to share, we have nothing to give. <coughs> we would be shirking from an important duty and privilege that we, the Jewish people, have today. And I believe the world craves to hear it if it's presented in its authentic language. That's my perspective. What is the essence of a far bringing? You gotta say that in one foot. <laughs> <laughs> what you dislike to be done to you, don't do it to anybody else. <laughs> That's the essence of a far bringing. The truth is, a far bringing is a very interesting phenomenon that was developed. That was developed by the early generations of Hasidim. Uh, in Chabad, it became a very powerful phenomenon. Um, I would say, in some way, during Fabrengen's, Hasidim interrupt each other. <laughs> so, so before Rabbi Jacobson answers the question, I, I want to remind those of us that are sitting here that I was, uh, when I was, before I got married, before I moved to New Haven, I was very fortunate to be able to sit by the late Lubavitcher Rebbe uh, at Fabrengen's. When the Rebbe would speak on 770 Eastern Parkway, the world headquarters of the Lubavitch movement, for many, 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 many hours and speak, um, not only during the week when he was recorded, like we're being recorded tonight, but on Shabbos when there was no recording. When I say many, and on the festivals, Passover, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, etc. When I say many hours, Daniel, I mean five, six, sometimes seven hours of the Rebbe speaking with very short intervals where we would sing Hasidic melodies and say L'chaim. And after Shabbat, there were perhaps a handful of individuals in the world that were capable of memorizing, just the, almost verbatim, everything the Rebbe said for five to seven hours, and they would sit down and write them. And if you come to my house, you'll see on my shelf hundreds and hundreds of volumes of books that were written by people who memorized five, four, six, seven hours of the Rebbe's talk week after week, year after year. Rabbi Jacobson is one of those people. Now you can answer the question. <laughs> so now that I got to hear my eulogy during my own lifetime, <laughs> <laughs> where do we go from here? <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, you don't want to ask that question after the eulogy. Right, <laughs> into the grave. It doesn't get better after the eulogy. But the truth is, I think you're touching upon an interesting phenomenon because I think the Fabrengen, hundreds of years earlier or 150 years earlier, before the 12 step program movement and, and meetings, 12 step meetings, of course, in a very different model and with uh, some schnapps on the table, uh, the our original Fabrengen among Hasidim was people coming together and sharing what is on their heart with each other. And this was a unique phenomenon because when Jews got together, it was to learn text, to study text. And that was the highlight of the Jewish religious experience, Talmud Torah, studying Torah. And one of the most magnificent institutions of Judaism till today, Jews come together to learn and learn and learn just for the sake of learning. I heard from the British chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, that he was once in the hospital. He had to be there for a surgery, so he was there for a few days. And he's, he's in bed, you know, in hospital clothes, uniform, and he's under the blanket. And an elderly Jew walks into his room. And he says, that's you, uh, Rabbi Sachs, Britain's chief rabbi? He says, yeah. So, you know, he thought he was going to say, how are you? I came to visit. He says, that's great. So we could sit and learn together. Here, I have a Talmud. Let's sit and study Talmud. It's a magnificent component. The idea of the Fabrengen was Jews coming together and internalizing what they learned. In other words, asking the question, not what have I learned, but what has the Torah taught me? Now, how much have I internalized it? Dealing with emotional struggles, with anxiety, with, with personal growth. That was the concept of a Fabrengen, a very powerful tool for spiritual growth and was very encouraged by the Hasidic masters, especially in Chabad. So the mission statement of the Fabrengen is a camaraderie of vulnerability, and integrity. And you know when people have the courage to be vulnerable, they can also be happier. Because, uh, you know, the less defense mechanisms you have, the easier it is for the happiness to flow. 
So the Fabrengen was there to remove defense mechanisms, to allow people to celebrate their vulnerability without being judged. Very, very powerful institution. And uh, it developed a long time ago, you know, before this vocabulary became so common in, common in the modern world. It's a Yiddish word which literally means gathering, like a gathering of souls, of hearts, of spirits. So that's what it is. The Fabringans of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's, especially the most recent one, took on already a different form. It actually became a platform for presenting very elaborate ideas, not only in Hasidism, but in Talmud and Maimonides and biblical commentary and law and current events. The late Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who was a seventh generation Chabad Rebbe, named Schneerson, they're all named Schneerson, son of Schneer because the father of Chabad is Schneer Zalman, so that's why their name is Schneer's son, by the way. Um, he would sit for hours, and he would use the Fabrengen as platforms. He would discuss often uh, current events, Jewish history, uh, Jew initiatives for Jewish continuity, Chabad Hasidism, Jewish philosophy, a lot of Talmud, uh, Maimonides, uh, Rashi, uh, many different aspects of Torah. But that's the general concept of Fabrengen. Okay. At this point, I want to thank very much the Jewish Society at Yale, Eliezer, for giving me the privilege of addressing you, together with uh, Honorable Professor Stern, on the topic of Chabad Hasidism. I thank you all for coming and wish you all tremendous success in your academic life, personal life, and Jewish life. Thank you.
was a spiritual pietistic movement that began in the 18th century in southern Poland around the charismatic figure of Israel Bachshento. It then spread up through southern Poland, eventually meeting stiff resistance in the 1770s in Lithuanian lands, in specifically Vilna, which would become the epicenter, the capital, if you will, of Jewish intellectual life throughout the 19th century. Well, what happened in Vilna that created this kind of backlash? What was it about Hasidism that disturbed those who were living there? Well, Hasidism was primarily a movement that galvanized lower sectors of society, but not only lower sectors, also higher sectors and elites as well. But what it did was it fundamentally said that Judaism was not something based simply upon political or social institutions. It was not something simply based on Jewish uh, rabbinic, the study of rabbinic texts, but it was something to be experienced in the real. Now, what made this controversial was to understand Hasidism, you have to recognize that 18th century Jewish life was largely controlled and understood by the institution of the Kehillah, the Jewish governance system. Jews were an autonomous, not so much autonomous, but had their own internal political and economic system. You didn't pay taxes if you lived in the 18th century to a to uh, King Stanislaw Pontiowski of the uh, of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. You paid your taxes to a Kikila, who then paid the taxes to the king. Your so any social welfare system was controlled by this Kikila system, this Jewish self-governing system. You were not a subject of the state. You were a subject of the Kikila. If you were allowed to live somewhere, it was because the Kikila let you live there. In that context, Jewish life was largely defined by certain kinds of socioeconomic institutions. What Hasidism said is that Judaism ultimately had to be about a religious experience. Now, what ended up emerging from that was once you start putting religious life into experience, it opens up all kinds of possibilities for what constitutes religion. Is religion me going off into the woods and having my own spiritual trip? Is religion sitting in bed with my wife, enjoying her company, having her pleasure in? Is a religious experience, is a religious experience me smoking a pipe, eating a piece of kogel? Or is it something based on studying the text? But once you say that religion can be found in experience, all kinds of possibilities are opened up to you. And so, those who wanted to restrict, or those who saw the center of religious life either being in political institutions, which were highly normative and controlling, or in the study of ancient rabbinic works, the idea of text study as being the central aspect of religious life, felt incredibly threatened by this new Hasidic group, which was claiming the idea of Judaism being found anywhere and everywhere. Now, one of those who uh, studied under uh, um, uh, different Hasidic masters, most notably a man named the Magid of Mezrich, Poland was someone named Schneir Zalman of Liadi, Schneir Zalman Borokovitz, which was his patronym, patronymic of uh, Ben Baruch, son of Baruch. Now, Schneir Zalman of Liadi famously tried to confront the Gon of Vilna and his Mithnagid opponents on the issue of Hasidism's legitimacy. And what he tried to argue was that Hasidism was not an antinomian group, was not a group that was into pleasure-seeking and all kinds of deviant religious behavior, but rather was a normative group that was some that group that believed in the importance of 
law and order. But the Duke of Vilna shut the door on him famously when he came to visit him in, in the 1770s. Schneider Zalman continued, though, to uh, garner support from different uh, sectors of Lithuanian society. Now, during his lifetime, the Golden of Vilna issued three bans against the Hasidic group. One in 1778, one in last one in 1796, shortly before he passed away. Schneider's Amun of Liadio continued to gain, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about these bans is they tell you that, that the other group is gaining its stature also. Now, all the fights between the Hasidic including book murders, numbers of killing and certain excommunication, flogging, you make all. All those were internal debates until the Golden of Vilna died. They all took place in the context of the Jewish community. In a there was a problem, you would have the local Jewish community, whether it be in Shklov or whether it be in Vilna, take matters into their own hands. They would actually have uh, deputized uh, police-like figures, which is called a rogue nela, which would uh, take a person, put them in a kuna, which is the Polish word for a, a, a pillory, and would pillar the person. Or they would excommunicate them. Or they would uh, put a ban on buying things from this person's shop. That was how the fight was being waged, for the most part, up until the Gona Vilna's death. Now, when the Gona Vilna uh, passed away, the fight began to be ratcheted up. Now, first of all, he passes away on, on, on one of the Jewish festivals in which one is commanded to continue to observe the festival, even if somebody Died. So you can imagine, you have all the Mithagim who are sitting there crying over their master's death, and the Hasidim now are even extra happy that here their chief opponent had, had passed away. Well, <coughs> soon thereafter, the Mithagim, the opponents of the Hasidim group, began to um, make a decree that people should hunt, hunt down and capture all Hasidim. At which point the Hasidic, in fear of the Mitnagim, Mitnagim hunting them down. And by the way, there was a threat. You have to understand something in the background. Very important. What the Mitnagim feared was that the greatest, the greatest calamity to happen in the 17th century Jewish life, besides the Kalmanitsky Grunt, the greatest spiritual calamity was the emergence of the false messiah sabotite state, Shabbat which garnered support all over Eastern Europe, took everybody up to Turkey, and then ended up converting them all to, uh, to, to, to Islam. It's a story in and of itself. But many of the ideas that were found in Sabbatianism were also present in certain Hasidic groups. Now, Cher Zamanuliadi would do is he would go out of his way over the course of his life to combat those charges. Coming back to the, to, to the, end, of the uh, end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, what would happen is that the Hasidim would then go to the government and tell the government, we are being persecuted. You, government, Russian state, which took over 1.5 million Jews in 1795, have already decreed that religion is privatized, that there is no more self-governing system that has the ability to coerce, to have restrictions on where people live, to be able to tax people. In other words, Jews were now subjects of the state, not subjects of a Jewish governing system, and likewise becoming a subject of the state allowed them to practice their religion as they saw fit. And so, the Mithnagdim would say, no, 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 we want to have that power, we still want to have the coercive power to enforce a certain kind of elite view or elite reading of Judaism. Now this would end up leading to 
the Hasidim, after the Hasidim went and, and did this, came to the government, the Mithnadim, of course, came right back to the government, which led the government to say, what's going on here? Well, the Mithnadim claimed that what was really going on was these Hasidic groups, and most notably, they went after specifically the, the leader of the Hasidic groups in Lithuania. Remember, most, most of these Hasidic groups are in Poland, southern Poland. These are Lithuanian lands we're talking about. So the most identical Hasidic master in Lithuanian lands was Shneir Zalman of the Adi. And they claim that Shneir Zalman of the Adi was actually a covert Frenchman who was trying to spread antinomian, libertarian ideas and was engaged in celebrating the pleasures of life, feasting and smoking and enjoying, that this is a person who has no respect for any law. You read the, 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 uh, the, the documents that were sent to the, to the uh, and specifically the, the Minister of Justice in 1798. That is what the charges were. Shares on the Adi then is forced to respond to these charges. And in his response to these charges, he argued as follows. Here are quote. So the mercy of God rested upon us when the government of the Russian Tsar came to power and spread across Poland a government system uh, and spread across Poland a governing system that did away with the communal rabbis. And then people were free under the Russian state and permitted to worship as they deemed fit. In other words, what Shantan Liliani was arguing for was the very concept of freedom of religion. That was his argument. His argument was, was once Judaism is no longer a corporate institution no longer a political, socio-economic institution, but rather, Judaism is a religion, it ought to be granted the same rights of any religious group. But he would go a step further. Not only would he say, argue, that Hasidism, and specifically his version, his brand of Hasidism, was not antinomian, but rather it represented the apex of, or the uh, best example of the Jewish, of the Jewish legal system. Rather, what it emphasized was the aspect of Jewish rituals. And what Shem Zamuviyadi did was he argued, in the same way in which we are subservient to God, through our practice of religion, is the same way in which we are subservient to the state. Then ultimately, Hasidism is not an antinomian, but rather the most normative of groups. Now, as a side note, you should know, Shir Zambiani wasn't wrong for what, for what he was arguing. For example, the Golden of Vilna, his chief nemesis, never wrote a code in his lifetime. Before Shir Zambiani would write his Tanya in 1795, the first, the first book he actually published was a book on the laws regarding the observance of Torah study. Famously, Shneir Zamudyari actually wrote a code of Jewish law, whereas Elijah Vilna never even wrote one in his lifetime. Shneir Zalman actually penned one, but he did something original. What he did was he took Jewish law and he turned it into Jewish ritual. What do I mean? The difference is Jewish law, you, Jewish law is something which is based on us or uh, not permitted, or mutar, something permitted, something which is based on force or coercion. It assumes that Judaism is a legal system which has the means to enforce observances and practices as a legal system would. What Shneir Zalman did in his code was he emphasized the ritualistic aspects of it, the aspects of experiencing 
the rituals themselves. And so, when Shem Zaman of Liadi will explain what is the concept of Ta'amei HaMitzvah, the grand philosophical idea of medieval Jewish life, the reasons behind the commandments, he will not give a legal argument for the upkeep of society. He will not give a rational argument that it is there for ethical purposes. Rather, he will say, Tamei HaMitzvah does not mean reason. Rather, it means time to taste what you're doing right now. The pleasure and enjoyment of the mitzvot are what is most critical. The, the physical experience of putting on filling, of putting on uh, um, phylacteries, of putting on a prayer shawl, of eating on, uh, on, on the Sabbath. That is what the mitzvot, the commandments, are about. They are not specifically just about rights and wrongs. They are about a certain kind of lifestyle that is also pleasurable. And pleasure is not something to be found in antinomian activities, activities that undermine the legal order, but rather pleasure is something that comes out of a normative experience. In so doing, Schneer's on Liadi was able to bring together the two antinomies in Hasidism and in Midnagism. On the one hand, the normative character of Jewish law that was seen as a kind of benchmark of one's relationship to a authentic religious tradition, and on the other hand, the importance of pleasure, people <coughs> wanting to be able to enjoy themselves in religious life. The bridging of that chasm is what made Schneer Zalman of Liadi's theology not only something that could be seen as part and parcel of the Jewish tradition, but also something that was able to garner a following and support. Now I'm going to just stop here before I stop for questions. I want to talk a little bit about what the enduring influence is. Look, there's a lot of parts about each one of these movements that I think we could uh, question or ask for them to be different. Certainly Chabad's relationship to, to Zionism is radically Transformed originally, vehemently, vehemently opposed not only to, to Zionism, but the idea of Jews, and the whole idea of there being even a Jewish state, even if the people were to be religious, it was totally against. Even if they were to be religious, I mean, in this regard, there were certainly things that we could say uh, not to its credit. But one thing to Schneider Zalman's credit that I think runs through Chabad from beginning to end, that is. Shem's uncle Yadi was not embarrassed about being a Jew. What I mean by that was he wasn't embarrassed to publicly express himself. That starts already from the dissemination of the Tanya, from the most popular Hasidic works, where Shem's uncle Yadi already views the printing press to publicize Hasidism outside of his own specific court, his own domain. And it follows through Hasidic all through Lubavitch, uh, Lubavitch uh, history. The idea of publicizing Judaism. And, and, and where this we see this most is, you know, tis the season. We're about to enter <laughs> the holidays. This is not just Chabad taking advantage of this. This is a serious theological, philosophical position since its beginning to believe in the importance of publicizing Judaism. That Judaism should be in the public sphere. Now, the great irony is that who knew it wouldn't be in Russia where that could be celebrated, but it could be celebrated in a place like America, where we where we recognize the importance of various minority groups being able to express themselves in a way that both universalizes their message and takes into account its its particularity. So while Chabad might have, has, might have transformed the meaning of, of, of Hanukkah from something that fought against Greek knowledge to something now that celebrates the idea of a freedom of religion, which if you read the Tzemach Tzedek's writings on Hanukkah and you read the last of Bob writings on Hanukkah, they're different Hanukkahs. 
One thing does remain, I think, consistent. And that is the idea that Judaism is something that one should feel comfortable embracing publicly. It should not be something just hold up in a little room. The same way Mishnah Zalman was not afraid to explain himself in front of the Tsar. This was the same way in which the 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 uh, the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitch Rebbe, Menachem Mendel, Schneerson, not this one, but the third one, also went to went to uh, St. Petersburg in the same light to explain Judaism in the 1840s. And it's the same message that continues today, whether it be on telephones, on TV, or whether it be on, on Hanukkah lights, uh, Hanukkah uh, lights on, uh, on public, um, uh, in public places. The idea that religion is something that can enrich society. And to that, in a way, Chabad more so than any other movement in Judaism understood that message and gave us something uh, to publicly sell. But, but, the model for the rabbi 
in the yeshiva ended up coming from Hasidism. They became a rabbi. The original rabbis in the yeshiva couldn't give a damn about how you tie your shoes and get married to this one, get married to that one. That wasn't that bad. That what ended up happening was both of those things ended up coming together. So you have yeshiva, but the leadership structure is all Hasidic. Yes, no. Um, be ready. So I'm just curious. Well, so I'm curious to hear what you've uh, what you've discovered about the uh, the uh, the Alter Rebbe's arrest, and uh, you know, if you have any, if you found anything about that. If I find anything, I, all I found. I'll, I mean, to, to give a little bit more of the detail on the arrest. Can you repeat the question? The question was uh, the question was was what happened during this arrest of of of, of Shneir Two arrests. There were two arrests. 1798 and one in uh, 1801. Um, first of all. The arrests were largely were largely because the government thought that these people were revolutionaries. Now, interestingly, though, this is something very important, but it's a very important detail to the arrest. Who ended up mediating these arrests? Who was the one who decided that the Hasidim were, if you will, kosher? Does anybody know who it was? Well, I'll give you a moment. Who is the hero? of war and peace. Who's the hero of war and peace? For those of you who, I only made it through, I, I don't even want to tell you what was going on in my life that brought me, that brought me to that war. Um, but for those of you who made it through that war, who is the hero of war and peace? Pierre. No? No, okay, Pierre, yes, 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 okay, Pierre is, I would call him the, yes, yeah. Let's, let's talk, the, the, who wins the war in war and peace? Who wins the war? Okay, Russia. Okay, but we don't remember who. Remember, there were a number of generals. Then finally, Mikhail Kutuza comes in and saves the day. Russia's faltering; it's, it's it's losing, and Kutuza is sitting back and smiling and smirking, and eventually comes in and wins the day. Well, before Kutuza was saving Russia to become its greatest military hero, Kutuza was the governor general of Vilna. Uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. And Kutuzov was the person that all of the various petitions ended up going to. And he was the one who ended up ruling very calmly, very clearly, very simply, that Schneider Zalman Yadi, this Hasidic group, poses no problems in the to the state and should be allowed to practice as they please, and was uh, was um, and was essential in the drafting of the 1804 laws from the part of the Russian government, allowing for the freedom of religion and the end of excommunication of Judaism, uh, and, and end of excommunication that Jews were able to have in their societies. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, have you seen the emergence of? Uh Hasidism and Chabad in particular in the 18th and 19th century um, alongside uh, the emergence of orthodoxy and Haskala and uh, reform uh, movement or were they blocked off because they were further to the east? Okay, we have two different, we're dealing with two different societies. In Western Europe, you have a thing called orthodox that emerges with Samson and Rachel Hirsch as a response to reform. Eastern Europe totally different. Western Europe, maybe, you know, we even see it today, kind of the breakdown of denominations, the reemergence of spirituality, the kind of nationalist politics. Uh, the Western European model is like, I, I, if I were to predict long term, it's like a little blip. It's a little blip. It doesn't, most Jewish historians spend a great deal of time on Western Europe. You want to understand where 80% of Jews come from today. You want to understand how they kind of, the deep structure, it's in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, you have three groups that emerge out of the privatization of Judaism that happens at the end of the 18th century. Why is the question? Three groups. Remember, you can only have three groups when you privatize religion. If you don't privatize religion, you have one group, because then you have a political entity to control ideology. That's why 16th or 18th century, you have Shabbat for a minute. 
who's a kind of transnational character. But you don't have that. It's only once you privatize your freedom of religion. Three groups. Maskilim, Hasidim, and Mitnagdim. Those are the three main groups. Those three groups would end up all, all of them would end up um, going under, if you will, in the face of Jewish nationalism. And this is what, what, what took place. What happened is the Kehila structure does two things. It does two things fundamentally. Number one, define Jews as a body power. Define them by give an address. This, there is a place, there's an address to speak for one million Jews. The second thing that Gila structure, the corporate structure, pre-modern Jewish life did was it took care of people's socioeconomic well-being. Old people, sick people, shoals, schools, poor people, socioeconomic well-being, defined body power. State privatizes Judaism and says, you're no longer identified as Jews primarily, you identify politically as members of a nation state. Okay? Number one. Number two, with that, you're not anymore responsible for the civil well-being, civic upkeep of, your, of, of, of Jewry. We are, the state is <coughs> responsible. So you don't have the right to excommunicate, and we're supposed to take care of your socio-economic well-being. Understand? We're going to just finish this up here. Problem with that is that it makes Judaism turn into fully a religion. Okay? Transforms Judaism into religion. Now that happens in the West also. But the difference is in the West, you have a, a, a welfare state that emerges that begins to take care of people's socioeconomic needs. Begins to take care of people if they're poor, if they're sick, if they're this or that. You go to Russia, state's nowhere to be found. It takes, it takes years until something from St. Petersburg can even get down to Vilna. So what you have is you have the religion, you have the, the Judaism be transformed into a religion, which is about the spiritual and moral well-being. And so you have Hasidah, you have Bidadin, you have masculine taking, debating all these different things. But you have a state that can't take care of putting bread on the table. In that regard, Hasidism was better than the other two. Because at least they had a kind of social welfare system in place. Ultimately, though, all three of them were a joke. Because ultimately, people were poor. And the state wasn't there to help them. So what emerges in the 1860s is you have Jewish nationalism. Jewish nationalism says, forget Hasidim, forget Yadim, forget Yeshivas, what do we all share common? We're Jews, most common ethnic identity. Define political body. Number two, stop being a poor Nochschlepper. I'm going to go make you a respectable person. I'm going to give you a field, I'm going to give you land, I'm going to give you a place to work like any normal human being, and you're going to be able to put right out. That's the beginning of Jewish nationalism. In many ways, it ends up coming on the heels of what we're speaking about this year. Thank you very much. Uh, class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.